And uh, one of my favorite Canadian authors is actually a financial planner, yeah. uh, David Chilton, who wrote The Wealthy Barber. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's such a great book. What, what are your thoughts on that book? I love that book, and yeah. I love David Chilton. And, uh, you know, I think I told you this story before. I don't know if we were rolling at the time, so I'll tell it again. Tell it again. He, he's, he's, we're fortunate enough to hear him at this big congress for financial planners down in Mississauga. And he's up, you know, rallying the troops, as it were. The firm probably paid him. I don't know how much money to be there. But he's talking, he's telling this story uh, about how he was at the mall one day or the grocery store or whatever. And he parks his car in the parking lot, goes in to buy his whatever he's buying, comes back out, and someone had sideswiped his car and totally mangled it. Yeah. And the guy just brushed it off. He got in his driver's seat, he drove home, didn't care where other people might get frustrated or think, oh, I gotta fix this or whatever. And uh, one of his kids then said, Dad, you're so embarrassing, get your car fixed. He's like, what do I care? I'm gonna drive it for five more years. I'm the only one who drives it. I can still get in and out of the driver's door, no problem. He didn't care. And I'm like, man, that was awesome. So right away when he told me that story, he had my attention because I'm thinking this is a guy who's not, you know, he just, he's got it dialed in when he's thinking about money. Oh, seriously. He's not focused on the little things like a ding on the car or, you know, trying to keep up with the Joneses or whatever. He doesn't care. He doesn't care what anyone else thinks of him. You see, and, and granted, everyone in Canada probably knows he's a billionaire. Yeah. So they don't, really, they see him driving in a car. They're not going to judge him, but Dragging him down. yeah, he doesn't, he doesn't care. Right. No. He, so Fantastic book, great concept. I challenge him a little bit in the sense that you know he'll he'll say it's great general advice, say ten percent of your income. What I find in the planning business is that if we just have a goal like save ten percent of your income, it's not a sticky goal. It's very easy to walk away from doing something like that because we're conditioned when we have money from a young age, we get that allowance, we're conditioned to spend it. Yeah. So you save ten percent, ten percent, ten percent, all of a sudden you see twenty five thousand dollars in your account. It's easy to take that, walk down to the car dealership and buy a nice flashy car. Yeah. So what we focus on doing a lot is just taking that one step further from investment management or savings to say, let's identify some long-term financial priorities. Do you ever want to stop working? Do you want to have a retirement income of you know, X dollars a month, 5,000 of today's dollars indexed to inflation that'll last you till age 100? Do you want to leave your kids money? Do you want to pay down debt? Let's focus on these bigger picture goals and then let's build a plan that's going to let you achieve those goals. Yes. So if we're focusing on the goals instead of a number like 10%, those are a lot stickier. The client is going to think twice when they go out to make a purchase because they might know that by making that purchase, that's going to hinder their long-term goal of X that we spend a lot of time identifying together. The mindset is huge. For, for sure. For me, I could look at my financial journey and you know, before I was, I was worried what people thought about what I was driving and yeah. you know, what I was wearing and you know, if I was giving out the energy of being successful. And you know, I could pinpoint a moment where all the tips and tricks that guys like David Chilton, they started to click in my head. And that moment was when I finally got serious about tracking my net worth. Mm. For me, that was the moment that everything changed because knowing what you're actually worth, right? Um, it sort of gamifies the entire thing. Yeah. And now, you know, if I know my, my net worth and I'm looking at a, an expensive item, you know, maybe a thousand dollars, I'm asking myself, you know, if I buy this, the resale value on this item is like zero mm -hmm. in like two months. So my net worth is going down a thousand dollars. I applied this thinking yesterday when I was looking at new shoes, <laughs> you know, uh, you do CrossFit. Yeah, that's right. And yeah. you guys buy a lot of shoes. We right? do. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, <laughs> yesterday I looked at these shoes, they were Vans, they were nice shoes. And I, I must have like 10 pairs of shoes at home that I also like. I said to myself, you know, if I buy these shoes are $89, no big deal. I can afford them. Mm -hmm. But like my net worth is going down a yeah. hundred bucks right yeah. away. So I decided not to buy them. Yeah. And that's all because I'm very aware about, you know, the net worth. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that you need to become cheap. You know, it just means that you'll, you'll make better decisions. Mm -hmm. Maybe you don't go buy the brand new car. Maybe you go buy a used car that when you drive it off for the first time, it maintains mm -hmm. its value. Maybe um, you don't buy the super luxurious house. You wait and you buy something that has you know, potential on the upper hand. Yeah. So, you know, 
for me, all that stuff really, really changed when I got serious about uh, tracking my net worth. Yeah. So do you help clients track their net worth? Is that something that you guys do? For sure. That's, that's usually page one of the, of the financial plan. Mm -hmm. It's a snapshot of where you are today. Yeah. Very simple. Assets, liabilities. Have you seen that make a difference for a lot of people? For sure. I think it's a lot lower than, <laughs> <laughs> than a lot of outs. people think. So they see it and they're just like, Oof. because they think, you know, wow, you know, we got a million dollar house and we got, great, what's the mortgage on that house? Mm. You know, the bank owns that, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? What's the, what's the car loan? What's you got the, the car, what's the car loan? What's the line of credit? Credit cards. Credit, oh my God, credit cards. Yeah. Insane, right? And when I did do that exercise of tracking my net worth, you know, I really got clear and I put my uh, my debts mm -hmm. and then I did it a step further I looked at those debts and I said I put the interest rate next to it mm -hmm. and then how much that was costing me per year and man like you don't realize it when you're not paying attention and you're just paying that monthly mm -hmm. you know fee on the credit card but when you look at a 17% on a let's say a $10,000 credit card that's like 1700 bucks well and I'll take it one step further so the way these things are compounded and calculated, the way the interest rates calculated on these credit cards, let's say you've got someone with a $30,000 credit card payment, they're paying $600 a month. That might seem like a lot of money, but if you look at that $14,400 of payments over two years, the way these things are structured, $14,400 went to your payments. Let's just say, and without doing any math here, approximately $1,400 went to the principal. $13,000 went to interest. So it's not just the 19% on the balance and you, it's not simple math like that. Yeah. These cards are meant to just get you into this perpetual spinning your wheels of debt, Easy. where even if you're paying a nice big monthly amount, you could be paying you know, tens of thousands of dollars in interest and that is going straight to MasterCard, straight to Visa, straight to Amex. You're not even paying this thing down. You might be paying down 10% of your payments might actually be going to the principal. So that's why they take so long to pay down, right? Is that something you would recommend that somebody get rid of all their oh, credit card debts? I do it nonstop. I say, throw, you know, put your shame in the garbage and go ask, you know, the bank of mom and dad for a loan if you're that fortunate to have parents who could help you out. Or let's 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 uh, refinance your house. Let's get a line of credit. We have to get rid of this because mm -hmm. most people, if they have their income, they have their mortgage, they have their cars. That there's not a huge amount of room. I can't just tell somebody, hey, instead of six hundred dollars a month on your credit card pay $3,000 a month on their credit card. Mm. They're gonna laugh me out of the building, right? Yeah. They, how, they don't have the money, there's no cash flow for that. So we have to find a way to get this thing gone or else it's just gonna be a perpetual hamster wheel of debt. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. what can we do? Can we, and I, I, and I hate to just say, let's you know, put that debt elsewhere. We need to tackle the spending because if you just refinance your house and then rack up another 30 Gs of credit card debt, what have I done for you at the end of the it's day, right? Good, and it's uh, useless. So. We, we got to figure out a way to get rid of that. 